from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the program, Wednesday night, hump day, as they say to say, as they like to say, maybe hump evening, if we, if you would don't mind that. 833-4825-337, 833-4-VALDEZ is the phone number if you want to join our late night national town hall conversation. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And I think the, the top headline today has remained that a judge in Georgia has dismissed six counts against Trump in the uh, politically motivated uh, funny Willis case. Um, three, I believe, are of particular import. And we're going to get into this with some uh, in-depth legal analysis momentarily, but I just wanted to uh, give you that headline and um, jump into that just a little bit before we um, dig into the rest of the show. Uh, but we also have... Um, Another big story uh, today about TikTok. TikTok has made its way, the anti-TikTok bill, the ban on TikTok, has made its way through the House and is expected to pass in the Senate. Now, what's interesting about this, 15 Republicans voted against it, by the way, and um, this thing has its roots in the uh, the original version of the Restrict Act, which, um, in addition to banning TikTok, really just banned all sorts of free speech. And that was very problematic, and that was why it didn't happen. Now, a lot of people, myself included, you won't find me on TikTok. I mean, there might be videos of me on TikTok, but I didn't post them. I don't have a TikTok account. There's no at Rich Valdez on TikTok. I've never liked TikTok. I didn't want that app to live in my phone, and I've never messed with it. And from what I understand, it's the one where you can grow the fastest and the most. I know I know several people who started not that long ago with an account on TikTok and grown into the millions and they're getting paid endorsements and they're doing well as uh, social media influencers. Um, and there I am trudging away on Mark Zuckerberg's platforms like Facebook and uh, what's the other one? Um, Instagram. And um, and then now we have the Elon Musk platform, um, Twitter, which is OK with me. There's a little bit of engagement there, a little tiny bit. Um, and I probably don't post enough to really get the uh, response that many um, many would, would want me to. Right. They want me to. Re- to be a little more active on there. And of course, Truth Social, where honestly, that's where I probably do the best. I get a lot of response there. I get a lot. That's why I try to be on there as often as I can. But my point is that I, I've never really messed around with TikTok. And and not that um, I don't lament it and, and I, don't, um, I don't endorse it either because I just haven't done it. I've just been leery of it. But the bigger question is, should we tell them they can't be here? Should we ban TikTok? Now, President Trump took the first steps on that. I remember when he said, look, you have to have a, a majority American ownership um, in your parent company. And that's when they changed it from my, for whoever it was at the time that had a 51 percent controlling interest uh, from the CCP or whatever and whatnot to ByteDance, which um, had some American stakeholders. And there were rules, right? I remember they said uh, that the servers had to be in the United States, that the information couldn't be shared with China and whatnot. However, that didn't happen either. And we know when the CEO of TikTok had come into um, Washington, D.C. and testified in Congress, well, guess what? He was like, well, you know, uh, he was very flippant about things. So we're going to jump into that uh, as well, probably a little bit tomorrow. Uh, but I did want to just talk a little bit about that because I think it's, it, is, um, it is important uh, because it's, it's a tricky situation, right? And the reason it's tricky is because I think the knee-jerk reaction is, yeah, cancel the commies. Let's get them out of here, right? And their biggest uh, proponents are the folks on the left that are likely saying things like, no, we love TikTok. We can spread whatever propaganda we want. Uh, TikTok has, uh, since it's been introduced in the United States, has it bought, um, um, what was that music? Uh, Not musically, uh, Vine, I think it was Vine that it bought. But whatever it was, since it's launched, 
it has reached a lot of people and it has produced the, I think, the highest number of impressions. I think I read that in Daily Wire or one of the publications of transgender content anywhere in America. And largely, um, I think they are to, I don't want to say to blame, but uh, they played a major role in ushering in this new era of of transsexualness, if that if that if I'm allowed to use that word, in America. And what's interesting is it's it's grown in popularity, and I mean people just mindlessly scroll on TikTok. It's very uh, addictive, and you know I use addictive. Um, I'm going to be funny here. Addictive with a lowercase a, right? Ultimately, what I'm talking about here is that while I don't like it and I don't use it, it doesn't mean I don't think it should exist. And I don't know that it, that's the case. Now, listen, I, I, I'd be all in favor for banning the communist Chinese and saying, look, if you're affiliated with the CCP, you can't operate. Um, however we gave them some rules and they met those rules. And so now we're creating new rules. And um, some are saying that this is just going to move things around. I mean, that's kind of how competition works. So I think I am of the opinion that we should not ban TikTok, but allow people to choose. People need to make their own decisions. But at the same time, I do think we need to provide uh, guardrails and say, hey, look, this is not going to be a tool for spying. This is not going to be whatever. Now, if that is a foregone conclusion that it simply solely exists so that people uh, will put their information in there and it can track the whereabouts of, you know, through the G on your phone of uh, elected officials, Joe Biden, um, who Joe Biden's phone is next to, because that's what these apps all do. They know where you are. They know, you know, through geofencing, geotargeting, they know uh, wh who's next to you, where you, what mall you're at, where you are on the highway. All of that stuff is of concern to me when its information is directly going to the Chinese. In the past, the Chinese had to go like through Twitter and buy that information as an advertiser or whatever. So, you know, there's a little hop, skip and a jump. Now we're uh, just allowing them right in the, in the back door. And I think that's where it's problematic. So if if that is all it is and it is a foregone conclusion, then hasta la vista TikTok. But it doesn't mean I support this bill because the bill, I think, still stifles free speech. And if there's one thing I need um, in this life, it's free speech, right? It's what I do every day. And sometimes I do a good job, sometimes I don't. And when I don't, I get reminded by all the uh, the haters in my comments <laughs> telling me, have you ever heard yourself? How many ums and ahs can you do in an hour? I can do quite a few, sir, especially if I get distracted by the two or three TV screens I'm looking at. But I digress. Ultimately, what I want to talk about with, with TikTok, uh, we'll dig into it a little bit more. We also have... Uh, a live report from the border, somebody who was just on the border um, doing extensive filming, and we're going to talk about that. Plus, uh, I'm going to touch on Hamas a little bit and what's going on with anti-Semitism uh, with respect to the war in Israel. So there is a bunch to talk about, plus your phone calls. I love your phone calls. They're always welcome. 833-482-5337 is the phone number. 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Breaking news. The House of Representatives passed a bill that would force Chinese tech firm ByteDance to sell TikTok or face a nationwide ban. The bill was fast-tracked and approved on Wednesday with 349 representatives voting yes, 66 voting no, one voting present, and 14 not voting. That is what's going on with TikTok. Now, again, uh, I talked about this a little bit, but you got the House approving this legislation. And they're calling it the Protecting Americans from Foreign Adversary Controlled Applications Act. 
man, could that get any longer? And, of course, it calls for uh, the Chinese tech giant ByteDance to divest TikTok or um, the uh, popular social video app will be banned. So it's an ultimatum. Um, and I think, again, find some uh, American investors and, um, yeah, I- I'm with that. Uh, again, am I with it? I'm with it in as much as it's like a national security concern. Where I'm not with it, who do they divest to? If I own something... I don't want you to come and tell me that I got to sell it to somebody in order to. And I guess if you want me in your country, I have to make that decision on my own. But it seems like government interference. And I, I normally, you know, if it was any other place, I, I would be like, this is wrong. But when it comes to China, they have a very um, soft spot in my heart to get hated on because I just can't stand the communist Chinese. Not the people in general, but the, uh, the party, uh, the Maoists within them, right? Xi Jinping at all. So point is, while I'm still conflicted over some of this stuff, um, I think it it is a good idea to prevent uh, communist foreign entities from owning some of the largest social media platforms in our country, especially when they have the reach that they do. So I think those types of guardrails are appropriate. The bill now is heading over to the Senate. Like I said, uh, they they says, you know, CNBC is reporting that it's going to have an uncertain future. I just look at the support that it got in the House, and I think, come on, if if they can only find 15 Republicans to say no to this in the House, good luck finding 15 of them in, in the Senate. It won't happen. Uh, this, in my opinion, will likely pass. When was the last time a Republican fell on their sword because of a conservative issue in uh, in the Senate, right? I can't remember a time. I can't remember a time where where somebody said, no, absolutely not. I will blow this thing up. We're shutting this thing down. I understand the rules are different, but you just don't hear it. You hear some protests from some of the more conservative members in the Senate. Sure, I I hear the protest, but I don't ever hear them going at McConnell because he's got the majority there in within the minority. Right. He's he's there are more turtles in the Republican Party in the Senate than anything else. You've got turtles and rhinos, uh, and, and there's a great, some great rock star conservatives as well, uh, but there's a lot of folks that are willing to, to bend for a friend on certain issues like this. So I don't see this being a uh, something that's going to stall. And, uh, and that's the, um, the point on that. Now, I think we have a clip of audio on this. Who do we have here? We have um, McClintock. I think he agrees with me. Uh, listen to Congressman McClintock from California. Listen to this. The last thing we should do is take that power away from the people and give it to the government. The answer to authoritarianism is not more authoritarianism. The answer to CCP-style propaganda is not CCP-style oppression. Let us slow down before we blunder down this very steep and slippery slope. Now, he wasn't the only one commenting on this. Um, Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers uh, from Washington State, she um, also gave TikTok an ultimatum. We have given TikTok a clear choice. Separate from your parent company, ByteDance, which is beholden to the CCP and remain operational in the United States or side with the CCP and face the consequences. The choice is TikTok's. So there you have it. Uh, I don't know, honestly. I don't know how this... Um, ultimately works out right um seems like it's it's a pretty much foregone conclusion and it's going to happen but i agree with mcclintock's statement we don't use uh ccp styled oppression to do things and i think they put your heads together and we can work things out but i think having ccp divest good idea and if they've refused to then it's a different story but this can't be in my opinion one company i think you got to do it across the board and be like hey who else what, what else do you have your meat hooks into? Because otherwise, we're in the same exact position we've been in for a while. Now, I want to switch gears a little bit and uh, go to, let me see. Um, Mr. Hinton was just telling me about a story during the break, but now I've misplaced it. Story number four, Olivia Rodrigo hands out condoms. Oh, news. I was like, that doesn't sound like the story that I was <laughs> Uh, live radio, folks. Bear with me. 
Survey finds nearly 30% of Gen Z identify as LGBTQ. Now, I I was telling him during the break that while I'm not that old, 20 years ago, I was 25. And 20 years ago, the heavy-handed political commentary that was coming out of my mouth was something like, give us 20 more years and all these radical feminists out here are going to be claiming to be lesbians. Because back then, only 1% to 2% of the population identified as gay or lesbian. However, here we are. And you have nearly 30% of Gen Z women. Now, I want to remind you, Gen Z is the generation, and I'm sure you know this, I'm the one that requires the reminding. Gen Z is the um, generation that follows millennials, right? So just as a point of reference, millennials are more conservative than Gen Zers on on many issues, not all. Uh, But it's fascinating to me that this is happening because I said it very tongue in cheek. Something else I used to say back in like 2005, so about 19 years ago, I remember specifically making a case when I saw, you know, any, any type of freebie being given out or social program, I would tell people, but come on, you know, politicians will tell you anything. You know, if a politician came out and said, look, I, I advocate that everybody in America should be a homeowner and every, the right to own a home is, is a, you know, a core value, an American right, would, would you believe them? Would you think that it's the government's responsibility to provide everyone with a home? And it didn't matter what aisle uh, these people assigned themselves to, conservative, Democrat, uh, liberal, Republican, whatever. They all said the same thing. Absolutely not. It's not the government's job to fulfill the American dream in your life. Everybody agreed. Every single person. I never found somebody that said, well, you know, yeah. No. They all, they, they, the, the best you got there was, I think it's the government's job to provide shelters for homeless people. But that was it. They didn't say they had to go buy the homeless people a house either. However, we're in a stage uh, of, of our development as a country where, voila, we have arrived. We now have people and politicians that advocate for things like that, saying, you know, it, um, health care is a right. Housing is a right. Is it really? Come on. I think that's, a, that's an overstatement. It's, it's way beyond the pale. But that's where we are. That's where we've landed. And it's amazing how analogies I made, again, close to 20 years ago, to try and make sense of things, to bring an argument to its um, um, logical extreme to show how weak it was, are now arguments that are still out there or are starting to be out there. And they just, they make no sense. Anyway, Gen Z. So I'll I'll touch back on this as well as uh, some audio that I've got that I think uh, goes well with this. And we could uh, do a segment on that a little bit later. But I want to talk a little bit about Hamas, and I want to dig into this stuff with Funny Willis dropping six charges, three of which uh, have a a particular impact on on Trump's case, uh, with a new judge saying, this doesn't pass muster. This is not it. Um, You're you're alleging this, and there's no way they can make an intelligent defense. And again, these are things his his team was arguing from day one and that we've talked about on this program. So we're going to talk about that with Cornell University professor William Jacobson coming up. Don't go anywhere. The phone number, 833-482-5337. I'll be doing uh, some phone calls around 1049, 1050, 1051 or so. So if you want to call in, feel free. All right, folks, I am Rich Valdez. We're coming right back. Don't go anywhere. that all the counts had been dropped because that's probably what should have been. I mean, at least it was a step in the right direction. It goes to the sloppiness of, frankly, the the prosecutors down there. We know that that's the case. And more importantly, that this should not have been brought in general. Uh, the attorney handling this case put out a statement that I think says it all, uh, you know, and, and at the end of the day, remember, we've got a prosecutor here who's currently being questioned about her own ethical obligations, her ability to even stay on this case. I'm going to defer to this judge to make the right decision. But today was a good step in the right direction. All right. That is uh, President Trump's attorney, Alina Haba, 
uh, making uh, some comments earlier with uh, respect to certain charges in the case, uh, the big RICO case uh, that uh, District Attorney Funny Willis, as I like to call her, brought against uh, President Trump and the um, some of the allegations, again, that he was strong arming the secretary of state there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to dig into that uh, because I know that you've heard some cursory overview from many pundits and lots of people who um, like to play lawyers on TV. But I've got a lawyer that actually is a lawyer. He actually teaches other lawyers. He's Cornell Law Professor, founder of EqualProtect.org, Professor William Jacobson. Uh, you also know him from the uh, fantastic uh, blog site, Legal Insurrection. Professor Jacobson, welcome back. Thank you for having me back. You bet. So let's um, let's chat about this. You heard Alina Haba, uh, counsel to President Trump, uh, talking about these six um, charges that have been dropped in the Trump election case. Tell us what you can. Well, six counts were dismissed. The judge found that the pleading, the indictment, was not sufficiently particular to put the defendant, the defendants, on notice of what they were being charged with. And uh, those are six out of 40 some odd counts. And what I think a lot of people are missing is that this doesn't mean that they're gone forever. The judge mm -hmm. specifically noted that the prosecution could reindict and could beef up the allegations. Uh, and uh, so obviously it's a win for Trump. I mean, whenever you can get six counts thrown out, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, whether it lasts, you know, is remains to be seen. But the judge was also very clear that at least on the conspiracy charges, they, they remain in the case. So Trump's not out of the case, um, but the uh, key, one of the key claims, which is that famous phone call where he allegedly tried to improperly influence the secretary of state to find votes. That is out as of now. Um, the judge found that the alleged Vi so that was uh, accused of trying to induce the Secretary of State to violate his constitutional oath. And the judge said, well, you can't just say constitutional oath. You've got to say specifically what he would have violated. Um, but that was that really was the headline in this case for for many months, uh, that that phone call. I think right. it's an unfair, unfair characterization. I don't think anybody listening to that phone call could fairly say uh, that Trump was saying, find, you know, make up votes. I mean, he clearly was saying, we think there are more votes out there. You just have to count them. So I, I think it was totally unfair to charge him with it to begin with. But that was what everybody was talking about for, you know, a year or two in this case. Uh, and that that is gone as of now. Well, again, from a from a layman's point of view and from a, a political perspective, I can say, they hung their hat on this. Right? They used that clip of audio to make it sound like he was some sort of gangster strong arming a public official to uh, to the basis to create a RICO case. Now, that may not have been the basis for it legally, but it certainly was, I think, in the court of public opinion. So based on your experience and, you know, whatever you could infer from what you've uh, observed thus far, what are your thoughts on how this proceeds, do you think that uh, the, do they a change the prosecutor because she's been in hot water? And if so, do they change the prosecutor and bring new charges? Uh, how do you think that plays out? Yeah, w what a mess this case is. What a mess all of these cases are. And that's what happens when you weaponize prosecutors offices for political purposes that, you know, it was that phone call. Uh, in Georgia that kicked off the whole case, kicked off the whole investigation. It's now been thrown out. It was a nothing burger to begin with. Um, and, you know, I really, I think it'll depend what the prosecution down there wants to do. As of now, I think they've got an August 5 trial date. I don't know if that was ever real, if that's realistic, but if they have to go through the re-indictment process, this is not going to get to trial before the election. So the prosecutors are going to have to decide do they want to go with what they still have, uh, which when it relates to Trump is really just a conspiracy charge, or do they want to reindict on these charges and know that that will mean it's not going to happen this you know election cycle? So that, that'll be their decision. But I am extremely uh, skeptical of the conspiracy charge here as it relates to Trump because 
you know, again, they're not really clear what he was, he personally was conspiring to do that was illegal. And they're trying to hang, hang his hat, you know, get him on what others did. Because if you have a conspiracy and if you're part of the conspiracy, you're responsible for what other people do. Uh, and, but it's not really clear what he did that would be illegal in of itself. And so I'm not saying there's no legal jeopardy for him, but I am saying that it's, to me, a stretch of a case. Now, Professor Jacobson, uh, I agree with you on that. And again, I'm not basing it on my years of, of being a professor of law. I'm basing it on my eyeballs and what I see and read in the media. But it seems to me that uh, conspiracy charges tend to be difficult to prove and uh, absent, you know, um, somebody turning state's evidence or, you know, some sort of undercover FBI recordings of, you know, like they got Gotti or these other people. It's difficult. At least that's been my my assessment. Do you think that they have a clear path to victory in prosecuting these these uh, conspiracy charges? Well, I think the first question is, is he going to get a fair jury? OK, so the, the D.C. case and the Georgia case are essentially now conspiracy cases that he conspired mm-hmm. with others to overturn the election. The problem I've had with both of those cases since day one is that you normally charge a conspiracy to do an illegal thing. Overturning an election is not in and of itself illegal. People try it all the time. People sometimes are successful if they get a good court ruling. How you do it can be illegal. And that's where I think these cases are are weak, which is, yes, he attempted to overturn the election, but did he do it in an illegal way? That's the question. Uh, you, You know, people conspire all the time to do lawful things. They coordinate. They, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. So that's the issue I have. What did, you know, Trump do? What is Trump alleged to have done that was to further an illegal conspiracy? And that's not still not at all clear to me. So I think these things are, are weak. Um, but is he going to get a fair trial in D.C.? Is he going to get a fair trial in Atlanta? I think that remains to be seen. Yeah, and I think those are good points. I think D.C. is probably a foregone conclusion. I don't think there's any shot of a fair trial there. Maybe Atlanta, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know the jurisdiction that well. But what I what I can say is I think that is a good uh, question to ask. I, I think uh, a subsequent question is, do you think it's politically uh, worth it or um, maybe even strategically, that's a better way of putting it, strategically worth it for them to to bring this case um, minus the phone call, minus the the, um, the this what they've lost today, these six charges, uh, because they won't have time to keep their August or uh, trial date, um, or do they lose too much momentum if they say we're going to just do everything all over, or we're just tuck tail and run? Which I, do you think that's an option? Do they do that? I think they're too far into it. And maybe if Fannie Willis is removed from the case, um, you know, uh, the, I, perhaps then they would just let it die its death of never being scheduled for trial. I don't know. Uh, really, she's been the one driving this. So I think that would be a question as to what happens, you know, with her. And I don't think we have a ruling yet on that. We're waiting. Everybody's waiting for that ruling. But if she's kicked off the case, then I, you know, maybe a new set of prosecutors will say, you know, this is kind of weak. We've gotten some pleas from some peripheral people. Maybe we get some more pleas and and call it a day. But not with Fannie Willis there. With Fannie Willis there, they're going to go to trial no matter what. I mean, she has staked her claim to trying to get Trump. Right. So I guess follow-up to that is, does she, um, does that in fact happen? Does do you think that she stays on? Is there a likelihood of of her, you know, going somewhere else to allow this to move forward? Or do you think that the the idea is that it can only move forward if she's the one, you know, driving the bus? I think, in a, you know, obviously, I don't know the other prosecutors or know of them in that office, but this is this is hers. So if she is off the case um, now, whether that happens, I think is a coin toss here. I mean, really kind of tawdry behavior by her, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, questionable behavior, you know, paying state funds to her, you know, her lover. Okay. For want of a better word, Uh, you know, really questionable stuff. 
but I don't know if it's enough for the judge to say that she's got such a conflict that she's got to be off. There is contradictory testimony on a number of points, things that contradict her and her junior prosecutor slash lover, uh, former lover, um, you know, on the timeline of when they met, which is important, or when they started, you know, having a relationship because that influences the payment of money. You know, it's one thing if you're paying money to an outside lawyer and then you become romantically involved. Very different if you're romantically involved. And then you start paying state money to that person, uh, and particularly if you lie about it on the witness stand. So, you know, I think she has a lot of potential problems. It'd be very curious how the judge rules there. But this whole thing is a mess. I mean, this is disgusting, to tell you the truth, uh, to have these people prosecuting him. Right. Professor William Jacobson, uh, Cornell Law Professor and uh, founder of EqualProtect.org. Uh, I want you to come back with us and uh, talk a little bit about the speeches at the Oscars and how um, it, there there seems to be a, a lack of tolerance when it comes to um, Israel. And I want to get your your um, take on that when we return. Folks, you're coming right back with Professor William Jacobson. I'm Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. America at Night with Rich Valdez. If a ceasefire is on the table today, Hamas could agree to it today. Does he have a point? Well, uh, Hamas showed up uh, to to Egypt, uh, it's my understanding, for the negotiations. It was Israel that refused to send um, negotiators uh, to be at the table to carve out. You have to remember that a ceasefire is not something that happens magically. It is a process that is negotiated by different parties that have interest. And just to, uh, and so I just do to be clear, that I mean, I just Jake want to make sure I understand. continues to be an honest broker in, in, this, um, in this conflict. All right, there you have Ilhan Omar um, trashing Israel, saying that they're not interested in a ceasefire. When we've seen time and again uh, the Israelis uh, willing to entertain that, but um, never really being met. So I think the argument is going, it's a very circuitous argument that we have here. But she's not the only one that spends all of her time uh, trashing uh, the Jews. Um, Actually, another Jew himself, Jonathan Glazer. He is a a British filmmaker and uh, won an Oscar uh, over the weekend. And during his acceptance speech, uh, made references to the Israeli occupation. And I have to say... When people talk about this quote unquote occupation, and I'm talking about before October 7th, uh, I thought even then it, it was um, ill, Ill used uh, as, as the right word. However, I think now even worse of a choice, right? Where this is, they're not trying to occupy Gaza, they're trying to uh, eradicate Hamas as best I understand it. Uh, but I want to get your reaction to this from the legal perspective and your uh, perspective as a you know, as, as a bystander of this, Professor Jacobson, what say you? Yeah, well, the whole point is that we have a rewriting of history here. Uh, we have a, a, uh, a capture of the education system, which has produced people, has produced really a younger generation um, who think that, you know, uh, Palestinian Arabs are the indigenous people of the area. In fact, Jews are the indigenous peoples in the area, um, and that somehow Israel's near existence is a colonial project when, in fact, it is the greatest anti-colonial project. It's the the liberation of an occupied area um, by the indigenous people. And if it was any other group in the world doing it, the uh, Jews would be the heroes. The Israelis Jews would be the heroes of the American and Western left. But because it's Jews, they uh, they hate it. And so you have this completely false narrative of, you know, Israeli Jews being occupiers, not just of the, the West Bank and Gaza, but of the entirety of Israel. 
And it's really poisonous, and it's been going on in our education system for about 30 years now. Uh, not everybody buys into it, but it does affect a, a significant number of people. I mean, Gaza is a perfect example. Israel left Gaza, I think it was 2005. Okay, mm-hmm. They could have turned Gaza into the Switzerland of the Middle East. It's got a long coastline. I mean, practically the entire Gaza is on the Mediterranean. Um, they could have really turned it into something wonderful. Instead, they spend billions of dollars, billions of dollars in international aid to build what is one of the most complex military tunnel systems in the world. Uh, you know, hundreds of miles of sophisticated tunnels. And that's what they spent it on. So, so don't blame Israel for it. They had a ceasefire on October 6th, which Hamas, other terrorist groups, and thousands of quote-unquote civilians violated uh, and crossed into Israel in a surprise attack that we all know about and mutilated people, tortured them, beheaded them, um, raped women, sexually mutilated women. Even the United Nations acknowledges that now on a mass scale, um, kidnapped babies, some of whom are still kept in Gaza, those two right. redheaded babies that were in the pictures. So this is complete nonsense. I mean, Israel is a nation that where the indigenous people um, have a nation. The Palestinians had a chance um, through, you know, uh, the partition plan in 1947. Some 18 years already. Yeah. You know, that, that they had a chance to build something. Instead, their entire attention is to destroying Israel. So rather than building a society, Israel offered, um, you know, through the negotiations, including as people have testified at Camp David uh, in, I think it was 99 or maybe it was 2000, um, you know, a a Palestinian state on 96 percent of what is called the West Bank. Jews call it Judea and Samaria. Uh, And it's funny because that's the the historical name has always been Judea and Samaria. Uh, Professor, quite a lesson that you've given us this evening. Unfortunately, I'm out of time. Let everybody know how they could follow you and keep up to speed with the work that you're doing. Yeah, so uh, legalinsurrection.com is our main website, and we also have equalprotect.org, which is our equal protection project. All right, perfect. Thank you for being with us. I appreciate it. You are a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot. And folks, we're coming right back with your calls and more. This is America night with rich valdez america at night with rich valdez all right america welcome back and we continue our conversations tonight lots of things to discuss um one of the things i want to get into in a little bit is what's going on at the border. Uh, a lot going on at the border. I uh, also want to talk about uh, a, n- a number of things. Uh, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag just yet, but I do invite you to call if you want to join the conversation. Feel free. Uh, we'll be doing some calls on topic uh, throughout these interviews if, um, if time permits. And then, of course, at the top of the next hour, it's Open Phone America. 833-482-5337 is our number. 833-4-VALDEZ. And uh, oh, there goes the music. As soon as I get rolling. That's why I don't, you know, I don't say too many words because uh, they come right away with the melodic sounds from um, Alex Hinton and Count Delacula performing live. All right, folks. We're coming right back. I want you to stick with us. Hour number two, action pack. Lots to discuss. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. From the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. America's favorite late night talk program. Featuring interesting guests from around the world. And calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Valdez. 
Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to our number two of the program. Our late night national town hall conversation continues. And if you want to join it, feel free. 833 4825 337 833 for Valdez. And part of what we're talking about today is a lot a lot of news that's been out there and uh, a lot of things that I want to get into. And we talked about TikTok and we talked about um, a little bit about what's going on in Gaza. And uh, of course, the uh, funny Willis dropping some charges against uh, President Trump. But there's other news out there. You know, the, the bad guys, the the regular, the usual suspects, I should say, right? Uh, our regular cadre of bad guys in America uh, obviously um, takes no vacations. And it doesn't surprise me that there is a new group of Soros-backed and funded uh, folks that are creating these collusive relationships between our government and the financial sector, and it involves surveillance. I mean, how much more 1984 do we need? Obviously, I'm referring to the book by George Orwell, where we live in this uh, police state. But ultimately, I mean, this is crazy stuff. So there's a, an excellent piece on this in uh, MRC's uh, Newsbusters, newsbusters.org. And uh, Joseph Vasquez is the associate editor uh, for Free Speech America, and he's with us to tell us a little bit about it. Joseph, welcome, sir. Hey, Rich. It's a good evening in dystopia, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. It sure is, brother. So tell us what's going on here. Break it down, because there's a lot in that headline. Well, the House Judiciary Committee, as you know, put out a report um, with its select subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government, pretty much showing that uh, that federal entities, federal law enforcement, had been colluding banking institutions to surveil private transactions of American citizens. And guess what? Here's the kicker. They don't necessarily have to be suspected of committing any particular crime. So what what made this whole, this whole debacle worse, I mean, it's bad enough, you know, with big tech censorship, you know, big tech companies colluding with, with government entities to censor Americans. And I warned people then when the Twitter files came out, watch, it's going to come out soon that the government is going to be monitoring your private transactions. Lo and behold, here we are. And yeah. it didn't take long for me when I did the investigation to find out that somehow, some way, George Soros was tied up in all of this. What we ended up finding out was that the Department of the Treasury, through their Financial Crimes Unit, had circulated a document by the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, and which co-wrote this report with the Global Disinformation Index. And it pretty, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what that is. It's tax-funded news guard type organization. Yeah, that's the one that, through the yeah. uh, Department of State. Exactly. So the ISD co-authored this report with the with, uh, Global Disinformation Index, a hate group's blacklist. That included conservative and faith-based organizations like the Alliance for Defending Freedom, the Family Research Council, the Liberty Council. And they circulated this document to, to multiple different banks. And, it's, and according to the report, this report made its way into the hands of banking institutions that likely did business with these entities. And lo and behold, I recognized the name. I'm like, wait a minute. This, this group is funded by George Soros. I know this group. I've seen them before. Sure enough, Soros had given this group over $3 million between 2017 and 2022. And in addition to that, he also just happens to fund the Global Disinformation Index with $150,000 just in 2022. And to boot, we find out, like what we found out uh, when this whole thing with GDI came into the forefront, we found out that one of his employees was serving on the board of GDI. So, oh my gosh, I mean, like, you, I mean, come on, like you just said it yourself, how much more 1984 can we get? I mean, we right. saw the disinformation governance board. We saw it when they tried to establish this back channeling communication between the federal government, the Department of Homeland Security, and these big tech platforms. And we at the Media Research Center uncovered then that the co-chair of the disinformation governance board, Jennifer Daskal, used to be an employee for Soros. He was a research fellow oh, for wow. Soros. I mean, come on. So, I mean, like, he's trying to make the script of 1984 a reality. So this is dystopia. This is dystopia to the max. And it's bad enough the federal government is doing this to American citizens and treating them as potential violent extremists just because they happen to make, what, the wrong transactions? Just because they happen to be faith-based? I mean, give me a break. I hope the lawsuits start, start flowing 
as a result of this. This is tyranny at its best, tyranny personified. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? A couple of months ago, and I'm just going to back up a little bit because you're up to speed on this and you're fired up and I love it, uh, but I want to make sure the audience knows everything we're talking about here. Back in December on this program, we had covered and we had uh, folks from the NCLA on the New Civil Liberties Alliance when they re- uh, launched a lawsuit uh, against uh, the Department of State because they invested the funds to do development, testing, and marketing of this censorship technology, right? And they, the Daily Wire and uh, who else was it? And the state of Texas uh, and, and the Federalist all got their um, got in on that lawsuit. So the New Civil Liberties Alliance was, you know, asserting that the state apart the State Department used uh, something they call the Global Engagement Center to go ahead and create this um, global disinformation index that you just referenced. And, and and that in and of itself, I thought was was horrible, right? I mean, this was crazy then. <laughs> exactly. Now it gets worse with uh, what you're talking about and, and a different government entity now in cahoots with Soros-backed organizations that are now monitoring your financial transactions which we knew would happen when they said, you know, anything higher than $60, but we didn't know people were going to be blacklisted. Although we'd seen isolated incidents of that dating back to, I'm going to say, 2020, uh, where, you know, certain campaigns, uh, Stripe got involved in saying, oh, we're not going to do that with you. Or you're a J6er, you're this and you're that. It seems to be getting worse. Um, I have no doubt that you and I are probably both on this list because we disagree with them, right? And we're, we're calling them dystopian and, and Orwellian. But this really, really is crazy, Joseph. Oh, absolutely, Rich. You know, I'm a hunter. So I, I hunt. I mean, I, I, I buy my hunting supplies from, from Bass Pro Shop, and I bought them from Dick Sporting Goods. And guess what? Those are two stores that are mentioned in this House report that the, the, for, for, for banking institutions look out for transactions from those places. You know, so uh, this is quoting from the report. For people who, who shop at Cabela's, Bass Pro Shops, exporting goods, this is from the report. Quote, Americans doing nothing other than shopping or exercising their Second Amendment rights were being tracked by financial institutions, federal law enforcement. Now add to that the fact that Soros is somehow tied up in this. I mean, it, it, it's crazy. It's crazy that you just need to look over just enough rocks to find out that there's somehow Soros cash involved. And when I did a little bit deeper digging into ISD, I was looking at their funders. They list the Department of Homeland Security as one of its funders. Get that. They, they're very brazen about it. The U.S. Wow. State Department. But, but that's not all. It gets worse. You have the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs as one of the funders. You have the London Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime. You have the Norwegian Ministry of Children and Families. There's multiple governments pouring money into this organization. I thought foreign interference was supposed to be a bad thing. But the government <laughs> is wielding that. Against American citizens, and you were supposed to just sit around and be okay with this. I'm telling you, this this is just the next episode of this dystopian saga. It, look, Twitter, the Twitter files opened up Pandora's box, and now we're just seeing how deep the deep state really is. And the fact that Soros is somehow tied to it is just case in point. Yeah, Joseph Vasquez is the associate editor at newsbusters.org for uh, Free Speech America, one of their excellent programs there. And we're coming right back with him. We're going to continue the discussion on this. I also want to jump into some of the other stories that caught my eye on Newsbusters. Folks, if you want to join the conversation and chime in, feel free. Now's the time, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. is America. This is night. This is Rich Valdez. TikTok has lured 170 million American users with its quick viral videos. 
but perhaps nothing has spread faster than a plan in Congress requiring TikTok separate from its China-based owner or be cut off from its U.S. users. Just eight days after it was introduced, the bill passed the U.S. House overwhelmingly. Why in the hell would we want and allow the Chinese Communist Party to have access to our private data? Despite an 11th hour flurry of lobbying by TikTok. Which CBS News has learned paid to fly and lodge some of its most popular users to Washington this week to make their case. My name is Gohar. Including Gohar Khan of Connecticut, who posts strategy videos for college applicants to millions of TikTok using high schoolers. What would you do if it went away tomorrow? I would have to figure out a whole new strategy for bringing customers in. TikTok has launched tidal waves of push alerts, urging its users to reach out to their congressperson by typing in their zip code. Some in Congress already worry this might be an example of how China could misuse users' personal information. That basically, the company had used their geolocation data along with their zip code information to target these kids. President Biden says he'd sign the bill into law, but it would have to pass a sluggish U.S. Senate first. Leaders of the Senate Intelligence Committee have expressed support. This is a national security issue. But whether China would allow a sale and who would buy TikTok are open issues and questions remain about First Amendment rights. Passing a bill that could lead to an interruption or a elimination of the app is a huge monumental decision that I wish more people understood. So that's the latest uh, report from CBS News on TikTok. And like I said, I'm on the fence here. I don't want to use um, CCP styled oppression to kick them out of the country, but I also don't want communists in our country. Uh, Joseph Vasquez, where do you land on this? <laughs> well, I mean, if we know that, you know, the TikTok does present uh, a very serious national security threat. As a matter of fact, you know, our the vice president of our department was just speaking on Newsmax, talking just the extent of the data mining. I really don't think people appreciate just the extent of the data security threat that TikTok poses. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, you know, um, you know, my boss was was telling was telling us, you know, they they would, you know, if if you're using TikTok, if if someone is using TikTok in the military, they would know their their location. They would know if SEAL Team Six had been deployed to the Taiwanese Strait. They would also know whether U.S. servicemen in the 1st Infantry Division are being sent to South Korea. Okay, so that's serious. Especially right. if, and if, as if, I understand it, they can also figure out who who's the daughter of somebody on SEAL Team 6 and where they are. Exactly. So you have a very serious national security threat. And the question is, well, how, you know, how... Can the you know how can the president you know I'm just speaking generally how can the president address something that's very uh, that's seriously a national security threat? We know China is one of our top geopolitical adversaries, and now we ha- know that they're using this tool in order to mine data. Now the question is, uh, how do we deal effectively? This is this is you know as we're entering into a new wave of AI and technology, and the question is, how much data does China have access to, and how is it going to be weaponized against American citizens? TikTok is a threat. And which is why we have to figure out solutions and how to deal with it. It's 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 very serious. The threat is not benign. It's it's a very terrifying threat. And you know, I, I agree with you. It, it is. I don't think we see that same level of threat from the other uh, social media behemoths that we see out there. But something that you wrote about recently um, uh, was, I think, accurate. You said, "Be evil" should be Google's new motto these days. And it's true that there is such a pro left wing bias in all of the the big tech companies. Obviously, that's how it's been for for I'm not going to say a millennia, but for quite a while uh, with the Silicon Valley. I don't see it getting any better. Do you see it getting worse? Oh, absolutely. It's going to get worse. You know, James Madison had made this observation in the Federalist Papers where he said that power is of an encroaching nature. These leftists mm-hmm. have tasted the tasted how good power is. So guess what? Guess what's going to happen? They're going to continue to increase. They're not going to recede. And the thing, the problem is, well, yes, well, saw with COVID, the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story, the suppression of speech writ large, this back channel communication. The Constitution effectively is being put on hiatus for the sake of protecting the public. I'm like George Orwell in all yeah. of his brilliance and, and his foresight could have foreseen the extent to which his prophetic messaging would have come to pass. It is. It is. It is George L. Orwell's book if it was put on the juice. This is what we're dealing with today, and it's going to get worse. I mean, you just mentioned my story about Google News' bias. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we use data from, an all, from a company called All Sides, and what they've essentially shown is that the Google News bias you know, page on a multiple different stories were heavily leaned towards the left. 
63 percent. Yes, of almost exactly. 500 articles. Yeah, coincidence? I don't think, <laughs> <I> think <laughs> so. Not. I don't care. I don't care how far Google co- goes to try to make it seem like, oh, you know, we're not, you know, we're an apolitical player. Then open up your algorithm. Let us see what's behind what's behind the veil and stop being so shady about it. But guess what? They're not going to do that. They're, they're going to keep on hedging and making it seem like they're just a neutral, uh, a, a, troll, uh, a neutral entity in the big tech sphere. But we know better. We at the Media Research Center have analyzed Google search algorithm, and we've seen them repeatedly suppress the campaign websites of Republican candidates. In the 2022 midterms, it was ridiculous. It was in hotly contested Senate races. Google was putting thumb on the scale. You can, and during this entire 2024 presidential election, Google repeatedly suppressed the campaign websites of Biden's political opponents, Trump being one of them. So is it, you're asking me if it's going to get worse? It's going to get 10 times worse, especially because we're talking about a paradigm of power shift. As between now that Trump and especially a lot of a lot of a lot of conservatives and others, you know, they're aware. They're aware now that big tech has been doing this. You know, censorship is no longer some just some right wing issue. It's an American issue. It's a free speech issue. It's why the Supreme Court is now dealing with cases related to Murphy v. Missouri, talking about government colluding with big tech companies. Is that constitutional? I would venture to say no. The First Amendment does not permit the government to go to the back door to suppress to have companies do. Uh, do for them what they cannot do constitutionally through the front door. It is a complete dystopian reality. You know, Mark Levin had said it best. He came out with a book called Ameritopia. This is Ameritopia on steroids. This is what we're dealing with in today's political culture. Joseph Vasquez, I think you nailed it. And yes, kudos to the great one. He nailed that, I don't know, 10 years ago, uh, pointing this stuff out. And it, it seems to be getting worse. A very dystopian now. But in the time that we have left, we have about a minute to go. I want you to let everybody know about uh, the columns that you write at Newsbusters and how they could uh, follow you and keep up to speed with the amazing work that you're doing. Well, thank you, Rich. You know, you can find my work at newsbusters.org. I just released a study just uh, a few months ago analyzing Alex Soros, George Soros' son, who is now at the helm of the $25 billion Open Society Foundation empire. I did, if you want to know how Alex Soros is going to be leading his father's behemoth, you can definitely check out the study. It's called Meet the New Boss. You can check it out on newsbusters.org. We also have a website called censortrack.org. If any of your listeners have been censored, or if you've been censored, Rich, we want to hear about it. Reach out to us at our contact form on censortrack.org, and we're going to investigate and hold Big Tech accountable. This cannot continue going on. The American people need to hold this House report and the Twitter files and any other back channel and communication that occur between the government and the, and big tech companies and take that with them going into the election in November so that they remember this is what my government is. Outstanding. And, um, yeah, I think our friends at Media Matters for America were recently saying I was pushing the great replacement theory argument. <laughs> so we'll talk about that another time. Joseph Vasquez, Media Research Center. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. You're a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot. Thanks, Ray. Take care. You bet. Folks, we're coming right back to talk about the border. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. First of all, just say that my heart goes out to this young woman's family. Lake and Riley did not deserve uh, what happened to her. Uh, to answer your question succinctly, this is smoke and mirrors by people who are not serious. We had a bipartisan piece of legislation in front of us. It had a lot of provisions, some provisions that some folks on my side didn't like. But the only way to get uh, uh, comprehensive immigration reform, the only way to address the current crisis on the border in divided government is on a bipartisan basis. And so rather than demagoguing this tragic uh, death by this uh, young woman, uh, they ought to get serious. And let's pass uh, some bipartisan legislation and deal with the crisis at the border. Now, speaking of bipartisan legislation, one that 30 some odd uh, Democrats joined Republicans in voting for, the Lake and Riley Act, was was an act that 
170 or 171 Democrats voted no on. Again, this is an act that was basically just um, trying to secure 22-year-old girls from getting killed in a nutshell, right? I mean, you didn't have to be a 22-year-old girl. The point was if you're a criminal alien, they wanted to have the um, the administration needed to work with the executive branch and local law enforcement to make sure that these uh, these folks that have been arrested and were scheduled for deportation actually are deported and don't end up in a different state doing what this monster did to this poor girl. And we see it time again, time and again. It's not just this particular case, but that was the uh, the namesake of this particular act. And to me, it opens up the conversation to, to the larger issue, which is we still have a border that's unchecked where people that are unvetted are coming right through. Uh, when it's getting too congested, Biden is taking hundreds and thousands of these people over extended periods of time. I think the number was 320,000 people uh, that he brought across the border on an airplane. Forget crossing the border, just importing them right into the country. It's, this is obviously something that we have not seen before. It's not it's gone from turning a blind eye to being an active participant in the trafficking and smuggling of humans into the United States and doing it in in a manner that's sanctioned by the White House. How's that? That's insane. Well, anyway, I want to get with somebody that uh, has been down to the border and actually produced a documentary film called Border Wars uh, and um, from NTD News as well. Nicole McCaw, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Uh, I want you to give me your thoughts on on the, the clip of audio you just heard when um, Senator Warnock uh, says that this is smoke and mirrors. Is the situation at the border and the deaths that we're seeing uh, the, and the crime that we see as a result of our open border, uh, would you characterize that as smoke and mirrors based on what you observed in your investigation with this documentary? I do agree with what you have to say. As far as what we seen when we went down to the border, we found shipping containers of children. We found stash houses of girls anywhere from the ages of 14 to 18 years old wow. that were pregnant. So you're saying yes. it's not smoke and mirrors. Uh, he's saying this is all theater. Uh, you're saying it's the real deal. They're really bringing kids in cages. So here's what we found. When we went to go check on the NGOs to see the kids in cages, when we took a look at them, we found that majority of those children do not belong to those who brought them in. Now, what was interesting is in one evening, we detained 100 illegals, 48 were men. The rest were children who were zip tied and sedated. Now, I'm a mother from inner city Detroit. You you found children that were zip tied and sedated? Yes, sir. They were at 3.32 a.m. on the Texas-Mexico border. And when we called the ambulance and Border Patrol, when they arrived, they knew that the children were already sedated on Zoloft. And then they proceeded to tell us, if you walk around this area, you'll find the empty packets. And we collected one gallon zipper lock bag that you would use for the freezer. We Mm -hmm. collected one of those just in a few minutes of these Zoloft packets that these children were sedated on. So they're giving them these antidepressants to keep them from complaining and whatnot so they could smuggle them into the United States. Meanwhile, you have the senator from Georgia saying that this is smoke and mirrors. It's all theater. It's not really happening. Absolutely. And what else I find interesting is that, you know, in the documentary film, we actually ran ops in the state of Tennessee when the rumors were going around, when those of us who understand what happened were told that you're being a conspiracy theorist, don't be a racist. We said, okay, we're going to run some ops and see, are we gaslighting ourselves? Well, sir, as you can see in my documentary, we ran ops, Baz, who's in the film, Tennessee at night. You can see that it was Spirit Airlines running these flights with these children. You can see it was American Airlines. You can see them clearly in the film. And then when Baz went to proceed to ask them, do you know where you're taking these children to the Uber drivers and the Lyft drivers? They all said, no, we just get an address. And then we get a Visa gift card with money preloaded on it for dropping these children off to unvetted homes. The government is complicit in child trafficking coming from the border into the United States. That is correct. Wow. Now, 
listen, I mean, I, I, this is what I've suspected all along, and I've heard stories and read reports, but I hadn't seen it with my own eyes the way you're describing seeing it with your own eyes. And Nicole McCall, when when you saw this happening before your eyes, what, what goes through your mind at a moment like that? How could anybody with a decent moral compass agree to traffic someone's ch- children? How could they agree to that? Mm-hmm. How could those in power with the strike of their pen and the whisk of their breath actually protect families, women, and children? And we're World War champions back-to-back, sir. We have every means necessary to protect our border and our children. I do believe there is an agenda that is being shoved into the American people through the open border tactics. What, what agenda do you think that is? Personally, this is from my understanding at the moment, being 15 years in the media, becoming a local porter in New York City, working for the Outback Times and TD TV News. I do believe that we are facing infiltration of communism into the West. And why I say that is because in the Communist Manifesto, that is, there, that is a detailed playbook of how you bring a capitalist nation, a God-fearing nation, down to its knees through socialism all the way down to communism, sir. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that in the least, honestly. Uh, from what I've read, this it seems to be um, right on par with, with everything Marx wrote about. And it also, it, it just smacks of that for anybody that's ever lived there. You know, so many people that I know that have come from different places, but for a few Cubans that say that, you know, we'll never be um, like like Cuba here in the United States. And I probably agree with that, too. I think we'll probably be more like China's version of, of communism, where they still are have a robust capitalist uh, system. Just the government's got its hands in that as well. Uh, folks, we're going to come right back and continue this conversation. The documentary is called Border, War, uh, Border Wars. You can check them out online at borderwarsdoc.com. Um, Nicole McCaw is a producer and host of this documentary film, Border Wars. And we're coming right back. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. There is more news in your commentary, in your analysis, than there is on the news network. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. We are doing the best we can to manage the influx, get people housing. It is very expensive, and uh, the state of New York is in for about $4.3 billion. I would like federal money, and guess where the federal money is and why it's being held up? Mm -hmm. The Republicans in Congress Mm -hmm. and in the Senate said no because Donald Trump called them up one night the night before they should have voted on this mm-hmm. to send 2,000 more agents or Border Patrol people to the border. Mm-hmm. I need some on the northern border, by the way. We mm-hmm. border Canada. Mm-hmm. Money for states like New York. That would have helped us a lot. And just have a different path to citizenship and, and look at the asylum and whether it's too loose right now, the way it's being used and probably abused. So. I blame the Republicans now. The mess was bipartisan before that. Democrats and Republicans have not successfully found a way to have a path to legal citizenship because the employers want this. And I've said to the 10 Republicans in the House of Representatives who represent the great state of New York, told, saw them at the State of the Union. I saw them. I said, why don't you all march into Speaker Johnson's office tomorrow? Because there's 10 of you. You know that crazy Freedom Caucus? There's only 11 of them. So use your voice. All right. (laughs) I had had to take that one in. That's uh, New York State Governor Kathy Hochul uh, assigning blame for the border being open to the Republicans. Right. Her city and her state is overrun because of the Republicans. 
uh, our guest, Nicole McCaw. She's the producer and the host of the documentary Border Wars. And you can find that at borderwarsdoc.com. Nicole McCaw, when it comes to the border crisis, who is to blame? Is it President Biden and his administration or is the governor right? Do we blame, do we blame the Republicans? You know, let's talk a little bit of history here, because we talked about this in the documentary film when we did our research. And what's interesting is that the original wall was actually funded by George Bush Jr. due to the 9-11 and the increase of security uh, because of the situation that happened to us. Now, from there, Obama doubled the wall and everybody was fine with that. Then all of a sudden, President 45 comes in and says, no, we need to complete it. We have individuals coming in. We have caravans of 25,000 people. And you can't tell me that every single person in that caravan of 25,000 says, I love the Constitution. I'm going to respect your country. It only took 19 individuals to bring down 9-11. Now, this time last year in April, we had Mayorkas tell us on a national interview that they had lost several terrorists on the level five list. Now, fast forward one year later, we look to DHS and to CPS. They tell us we've lost 150,000 minors that have come in alone this year since January. I think we all understand who has unraveled the regulations, who has deleted the database and dissolved the ICE jobs, as well as criminalized our Border Patrol from doing their jobs. Yeah, I think it's abundantly clear, too. And I think this is why Mayorkas has been impeached and whether he uh, is removed by the Senate remains to be seen. I'm not very hopeful of that, but uh, I'm grateful to see that they took some action, even if it's symbolically in doing that, because the noise needs to be made. Now, you've seen a, uh, many things happen that you just told us about um, in in the time that you've been reporting on the border. If you can, tell us about some of the worst things that you've seen during your time at the border. Okay. Uh, if I'm, you know, I won't be vulgar here. I will do my best. Um, as, as a woman, as a mother, someone who's a patriot of the country, some of the things that we experienced were things like the rape trees. We heard of these things. We thought, how could they be in American soil? How could our Border Patrol, our police officers, our sheriffs, our wonderful officers, how could they allow these things to happen? Well, we went there and we saw what what they were doing in these trees and, and what the cartel, cartels do is they'll hang the underwears of their victims in the trees to celebrate, which wow. was one of the most evil deeds. We had to sleep in our vehicles. Uh, we drove 15 hours to look for a hotel, uh, somewhere that was safe for us to be because we... We're being followed. We had shooters in the trees. Uh, we were honey potted to Austin, Utah. I mean, the the amount of um, work that it took to go from state to state working with these PIs, only to discover how deep this really goes within our own government. I mean, here here's a fun little fact. Now we had someone infiltrate one of the cartels. We were able to obtain bank accounts and routing numbers that led from the Mexico cartels to the HSBC banks where they would take the American dollars after they sold the fentanyl and they're killing 400 Americans a day to a one-time use of fentanyl. They take that back, send it to the Chinese Communist Party. They clean it up and send it back in pesos. They're working together to bring this in. And it's literally destroying our, our future. It's not a 40-year-old crackhead or a 57-year-old heroin addict who's been doing it for 20 years. This right. is an 18-year-old boy, Teenagers. a 16-year-old girl. Wow. Yes, sir. That's crazy. And, and uh, I, I haven't had the chance to see this yet, and um, it sounds incredibly eye-opening. I intend to check it out. How do you think it's – we've gotten to this point where people, um, you know, they – they hear Biden and some of his platitudes about, you know, we, we, we're not doing anything wrong. We're just trying to uh, asylum seekers and whatever other rhetoric he gives. How do you uh, how do you reconcile the fact that people are just like, OK, sure, no problem? I think that um, when you're lied to a lot and you are constantly being told different things in different environments consistently, that's been proven, right, during the Nuremberg trials <laughs> after World War II, right? It's dangerous. Yeah. The media is dangerous. I think that 
everyone does have good within and everyone can make a choice to choose the truth. But when you've been gaslit for so long that it's, it's hard to actually see which is right from wrong with some people. I'm not saying a lot of people. I'm saying with some. And it makes me honestly feel very sad because every single human being is precious. That that's my understanding on it, you know? Yeah, I tend to agree with that. Uh, stick with me. We're coming right back. I want people to hear a little bit more about the documentary. Folks, we're on with Nicole McCall. We're coming right back. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. America at Night with Rich Valdez. When you first visit the border, nothing can prepare you for what it has become. The border is just simply wide open. These bracelets represent what group of coyotes they come in with. Drugs. There was enough fentanyl seized to kill every American. Human trafficking. I was 15 years old and I met my trafficker. A security crisis. How many people go missing? The caseload has got to be overwhelming. Yes, we got we got crossers right now. National Guard's in pursuit of them. And that's just the beginning of what we found. In the field, with the men and women who are doing something about it. Like you've never seen before. Border Wars. Border Wars, quite an impressive trailer. Nicole McCaw, tell us uh, some of the main takeaways in the film in the minute or so we have remaining. All right, some of the main takeaways is, one, this can happen to any family in any community near you. It doesn't, you don't have to be living on the border to be affected on what's happening in our community. And uh, we have featured an American girl that we heard in the clip where she met her handler online, and he held her in a basement in Long Island for three years, and you can hear her story. And wow. one of the, also the takeaways is the hope. You know, we only... It only took 3% of the colonial population to create the Continental Army. And we beat the most strategized and organized military in the world. So we got this. We got this. Wise words. Nicole McCaw, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. You are a gentlewoman, a scholar, and a patriot. Godspeed to you. And, folks, Open Phone America is coming up next. Our phone number, 833-482-5337. 8334 Valdez. Make sure you check out the film borderwarsdoc.com. I'm Rich Valdez. Live from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Good evening and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the third hour of the program. And if you want to join our late night national town hall conversation, I encourage you to call now. I'm looking for calls from the West Coast, Oregon, Washington, California. Where are you guys at tonight? 
And, of course, from the East Coast, WFAS, New York City, everybody out on the East Coast want to hear from you as well. And we always get a lot of love from the middle of the country. So I'm looking forward to your calls as well in Florida. We've got a few stations in Florida that listen to us. I'm hoping that you guys could join in. Why? Because we have some interesting stuff I want to talk about tonight. Really interesting. I mean, listen to some of these stories. Uh, Today was a crazy news day. And, you know, we get into the crazy news stories in the midnight hour here. It's midnight hour in the New York uh, time zone. Um, We talked about the Trump um, six charges being um, dismissed against the uh, former president in his Georgia election case, the RICO case. Uh, Then we have the House that passed the TikTok ban. Those are the two big stories of the day. We talked about that. We talked about the uh, George Soros funded group uh, being exposed in their collusion between the government and the financial sector with banks uh, reporting on how much people owe and reporting it back to the government. It's very, very, uh, very, very 1984 is the best way to put it. And I teased this a little bit earlier. Uh, There was a survey that found that nearly 30 percent of uh, Generation Z identify as, uh, in particular women, identify as LGBTQ. And I thought that was uh, kind of high, very high number. Uh, Then singer Olivia Rodrigo, she handed out condoms and Plan B pills in her concert in St. Louis. Uh, the reason for that why well, was to support contraception and health and uh, her support for abortion, of course. And let's listen to this one. Parents in Utah, they rape their own 15-year-old daughter, claiming it was safer than having her have sex with a stranger. I, I don't I have no words. We'll talk about that in a little bit if I can work up the courage to work through a story like that. Cause that's crazy. Uh, let's see here. Two men in Georgia allegedly set off a bomb inside a woman's home and planned to have a python eat her daughter. That's exactly how the headline was written. Seattle woman suspected of being kidnapped was found dead in Mexico. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, Let's see what else we got here. There was a man that just pled guilty to scheming to create giant hybrid sheep. All right. And, and, And... The Nigerian gunman who um, kidnapped 300 children uh, a couple of weeks ago are now demanding $600,000 in ransom. Now, that's a lot. I know uh, I put a lot out there. If you want to opine on those, feel free. Uh, I may not be I may not get to all of them in depth because that's a lot to discuss. Plus your calls. But it's going to be a lively one tonight. Now, we have a clip of former President Trump. making comments about the uh, Georgia case. Uh, Listen to this. So this whole witch hunt should be put out of its misery and dismissed immediately. This is a horrible thing that they've done. They wanted to go after a very highly respected United States senator. And somebody used some common sense. I think somebody probably higher up said, no, you can't do that. A senator that said, Is everything being honest in Georgia? Are they having honest elections? Let's indict him for asking that question. No, they tried to go after a couple of people that you wouldn't even believe if you heard their name. Their whole campaign plan is to attack me because they've done nothing else. That's all they have. And this is all coming out of Washington. I don't know if you know. I call him Lover Wade. Lover Wade. Lover Wade spent days in the White House counsel's office. Do you know that, right? Did you know that? North Carolina. Spent days in the White House and days in the DOJ. This is all a Biden thing. This is a, the Fannie is not a local state story. This is done in coordination with the White House. The DA in New York is done in coordination. They took their top person in the DOJ and put him in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office to prosecute a gentleman named Donald Trump. Isn't that nice? So the judge presiding over uh, Trump's Georgia election interference uh, trial dropped six of those charges uh, <clears throat> earlier today that include, um, you know, a bunch of different a, a bunch of different charges, uh, mainly pertaining to his calls to Brad Raffensperger, the secretary of state, indicating that he needs to find him some votes, saying that the uh, former president and his 14 co-defendants um can't legitimately be brought 
in on this. All right. He issued the order dismissing uh, counts number two, five, six, 23 and 28 and 38 of the 41 count indictment related to allegations that Trump and some of these co-defendants attempted to make Georgia officials violate their oath of office and finding that these allegations themselves were not detailed enough. So they can rebring the charges, but they have to drop the existing uh, existing charges based on the existing indictment. So that's that big win for Trump today. Let's see how long it lasts. I don't know that it will, um, but it might. They may want to move forward with their trial schedule and stick with the, the the rest of the charges that they have. That might be why they put 41 charges saying, hey, look, if they make us drop a few, no problem. <clears throat> we still have a few left. So I'm not sure exactly how that uh, is going to play out, but we'll see. It's interesting to see what happens, even if Fanny stays on the case. Funny Willis, as I like to call her. Anyway, uh, I want to get to your calls on this. Let's see. Where do we go here? Um, do, 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 do. Doc Wilmington, Delaware. Doc on WDEL. What do you think about this um, Georgia DA having to drop some charges against Trump today? I think it's indicative of what um, Professor uh, uh, from Harvard said. Um, I, I, his name's on the tip of my tongue. Um, the, the Harvard professor, Alan Dershowitz, Dr. Dershowitz, Dershowitz said on your yes. show, Dr. Dershowitz said on your show, he said, and I quote, not just the Supreme Court, but the lower federal appellate courts will throw out all this garbage before his emphasis, before the election. There will be no case. Yeah, I hope his words ring true. Uh, it seems like it's well on its way for that actually happening, Doc. Rich, may I comment on something else? Yes, go right ahead. Yeah. Um, if I was ever moved by any guests you've ever had on your show, it's the last guest you had before before Open Phone America tonight. Uh, and she is the best reason. She and her testimony to the American public on your show, your wonderful show, where you educate all of us, Rich, on the issues. She is the best reason to vote for Donald Trump in the next election. Only Donald Trump, in my opinion, can close that southern border. And if need be, my emphasis, send military units into Mexico to take care of, to take care of these cartels once and for all as foreign mm-hmm. terror, terrorist organizations, which he can do under the law in place right now. Yeah, I think that you just need to designate them narco terrorists and say that, you know, they're they're fighting the dirty fight. And we're going to fight them that way. And I think that's that's how he got the remain in Mexico deal. The um, the the policy that forced Mexico to start holding people on their side and stopping people from coming into their own country. And I, I, I agree with you. I think uh, the, the, the case for Trump is a very strong one. Uh, and, and it has been always. I think just more and more people are coming on board for whatever reason they make for themselves. That's fine. For me, it's always been the same reasons. I think Trump has, has been uh, solid. Uh, if, you, if you're able to put aside, as I can, I can put aside so much of the things, you know, um, mainly because I understand how this media stuff works. And I realized that people lie about people a lot. And uh, there was a, a cut. I don't have it to play it for you, but it was a really interesting one. I saw it on television. <clears throat> and it was of a guy named Donnie Deutsch. And he was commenting with Willie, I think it was Willie Geist uh, from, from NBC. And he was on MSNBC. And the commentary revolved around, he said, look, if you're comfortable with putting aside a guy that's been legally held liable for sexual abuse, uh, accused of rape, accused of 91 felony counts on four different indictments and 400 years in jail and whatever else, you know, he threw in there. Uh, if you, you can put all that to the side just because this guy at one point in his tenure had a decent uh, economy or did well with the one particular issue that you like, then then you go ahead and do that. But realize that you're part of the problem or something to that effect. Right. And I just thought, wow, how telling. And and that that's the, the key here. Right. They want to malign you and make you look like something that you're not so that they can then do bad things to you. And it's OK to do bad things to you because you're a bad guy. Right. And, and uh, in any other situation, the goodness within within all of us would uh, call that out and say, you can't do that to somebody that's wrong. But when you've vilified and demonized Trump as much as he's been in the media. And again, some people listening now are going, come on, he does that to himself. Rich, stop defending him. It's not it's not a defense of him. When I say these things, I'm really defending myself. I realize that once you create a precedent to go after somebody because you don't like something about them, 
whether it's the, the people that criticize me for umming and eyeing more than uh, is comfortable for them, or the people that say I'm a sellout to Hispanics because I, I don't support illegal immigration, or whatever and what have you. I mean, there's still people out there thinking if you have a, a conservative viewpoint uh, politically uh, or even a, a, a Christian worldview, that somehow you're less Hispanic. And it, it's crazy. You know, but again, this is the world that we live in. There are a lot of people playing, you know, um, race, uh, racial games. And, and Doc, it's, it's sad to see where we've come to. But ultimately, I, I agree with you. This woman did make a compelling case of why there's really only one serious candidate in the race. And in my opinion, that's Donald Trump. And I've, I've been with Trump for, for quite a while because the, the whole point of it for me is he's solid on the majority of the issues. And his bravado and his his own ego and all of that stuff only helps to make sure that he walks away with a victory. And uh, I'm OK with that. I'm OK with a guy that wants to win, that doesn't you know, that isn't afraid to be strong to win because he realizes they're coming after him and they're coming after his family. And if they're going to come after a guy with all that kind of money and that type of influence and who was a former president, just imagine what they'll do to me if they ever want to come after me. They'll do to me like they did O'Keefe. Right. When they rushed O'Keefe's house and he was in his tidy whities in the middle of the night and uh, or like they did to Roger Stone or like they did to Paul Manafort. I mean, there's so many people that they raided in the middle of the night, you know, stuffing their face into the ground, putting a knee on their back and, you know, treating them like criminals. And the only crime they'd committed was that they knew Donald Trump. Come on. That's crazy. Anyway, Doc, that's my thought on that one. I appreciate your thoughts. And uh, and you're, of course, your listenership to the show. Very loyal. I appreciate it. Folks, we're coming right back to the rest of your calls and more. I see we got calls from New Mexico, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and more. 833-4825-337-8334 Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. No hair, no care, and live on the air, it's Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Immigrants contribute into a system where they actually take very little out. Um, and that is for a number of different reasons. People think that immigrants have access to all these safety net benefits. They actually don't, undocumented immigrants. But even some legal immigrants do not. Even Social Security is propped up by the contributions of both undocumented and documented immigrants. All right. That was uh, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal from Washington State uh, saying that, look, um, it is the immigrants. We um, we owe them. We owe them. <laughs> and look, I, I'm not I never want to vilify these people. Right. Because a lot of people, they come here. They just want to hand down that these are pe- poor people in a different country that are being told, come to this country. We will give you free stuff. This is the wonderful country known as America where they give everybody money. It's a very rich country. You're taking people that have a a a, um, a, a not even a mastery oftentimes of their own language let alone ours. And so I really, I I feel like they're getting duped oftentimes, right? I saw one video of a guy who was down at the border. He's asking everybody as they come, he's like, hey, Trump, Biden. And when they put, when he says Biden, they all smile and they put a thumbs up and they go, yeah, Biden, Biden. Uh, Because whoever told them that they could come to the country, told them, you know, George, uh, George, (laughs) Joe Biden is opening a pathway to citizenship for you. He's giving you a shot at the American dream. 
And when you go, you're going to get a credit card. And you're going to get a cell phone. He's going to put you up in a hotel. So, you know, in, in their mind, they're like, I'm not an illegal immigrant. I came here the right way. I was invited here by the president of the United States. And, and it's for that reason that I just, I, I can't. Now, I know full well that there are other people that waited a long time to become uh, citizens or people that waited a long time to do it the right way and to have sponsors. And, and it, these immigrants are not in charge of our policies. Joe Biden is, right? So the, the reality is that Joe Biden is to blame, him and Alejandro Mayorkas and, and all of his mentiras, right? He's always lying about something. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody else is absolved from any guilt. I mean, I'm sure some of them uh, realize that this is an opportunity. This is a free uh, free paycheck for them. Uh, in particular, the gal- uh, the gangs that are coming from Venezuela, these these jailbirds that were once imprisoned or living on the street as criminals because it's a gang and they're here. And it's, it's, it's very unfortunate. But I want to get your thoughts on... Biden and um, and everything uh, with respect to immigration. Uh, let's go to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, KDKA, and check in with Jim. Go right ahead. Hey, Rich. I could not agree with your guest, Nicole, earlier in the last hour more wholeheartedly. It is a plot, and I've been telling people this for years. You can read a book, Christopher Russo, it's called American Cultural Revolution. It started in 1968. They started infiltrating the media, the elite elites in the college, they're radicalizing the, the people. And the open borders, if you remember Hillary, Hillary Clinton in 16 talked about it, they know damn well the middle class is fleeing the Democratic Party like a house of fire. So how do they get them? They let them in, 8.7 under Biden, 1.4 under uh, uh, Trump. And, you know, the president takes an oath when he signs. I take an oath to uphold the Constitution. Part of the oath is to secure the borders. Mallorca and Biden, for that alone, should be impeached. Yeah, Because they're destroying the country for ideology, and they will make a communist country. It's between, it's between China, Russia, uh, the Democratic Party, and the useful idiots of the media. I think you're 100 percent right. Yeah, it's you know, Jim, it's 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 a it's, it's a very difficult situation because, again, as much as and I've said this before, and, and hopefully somebody will prove me wrong, but I I see it being difficult to deport a lot of these people. Um, I could see how it would be easier to deport the criminals because you can flag them and hopefully you have an idea of where they are. Like these guys that were flagged and arrested in New York City and and put on the ICE detainer list but made their, his way to Georgia and murdered Lake and Riley. Right? A guy like that should be easier to get out because at least he's in the system. But every last person, I don't think so, Jim. Anyway, coming back to your calls and more, I appreciate the call. Don't go anywhere. Rich Valdez. By the way, your ratings are up. Congratulations. Thank I had somebody. It's always nice to check. I like to see, <laughs> even if they're friends, I like to see how are they doing? Are people listening, right? That's but right. But you're, you're doing great. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-482-5337. valdez That's Valdez with an S. TikTok has lured 170 million American users with its quick viral videos. But perhaps nothing has spread faster than a plan in Congress requiring TikTok separate from its China-based owner or be cut off from its U.S. users. Just eight days after it was introduced, the bill passed the U.S. House overwhelmingly. Why in the hell would we want and allow the Chinese Communist Party to have access to our private data? Despite an 11th hour flurry of lobbying by TikTok, TikTok. which CBS News has learned paid to fly and lodge some of its most popular users to Washington this week to make their case. My name is Gohar. Including Gohar Khan of Connecticut, who posts strategy videos for college applicants to millions of TikTok-using high schoolers. What would you do if it went away tomorrow? 
I would have to figure out a whole new strategy for bringing customers in. TikTok has launched tidal waves of push alerts, urging its users to reach out to their congressperson by typing in their zip code. Some in Congress already worry this might be an example of how China could misuse users' personal information. So there you go. Uh, TikTok has effectively become a lobbying agency. And uh, you can see how effective they are at getting people to mobilize on Capitol Hill. And the question a reporter from CBS just asked in that um, that package, he says, what would you do to this really educated guy who's teaching other people how to get into college? What would you do if TikTok went away? Um, He would go to Instagram. right? (laughs) How hard is that? Does it mean he'll be as successful? No, but that's what will happen. Right. Because I was on this wonderful platform called Parler. Right. It, it came. It, it, it was born in the wake of Donald Trump getting kicked off of Twitter. It was a free speech platform and everybody and their mama was on it and it was blowing up like wildfire. It was fantastic. And I don't know, I had 50, 60, 70, 80, 90,000 people, I think, or something like that. It was just this extraordinary number of people very quickly. And uh, lots of engagement. And I saw my podcast numbers triple when I would post a podcast um, episode on Parler instantly, instantly it, it would it would get three times the engagement I ever got on any of the other social media. And I said, this is the real deal. This is actually reaching the people. There is no algorithm to slow you down so that they can sell me an ad later. There is no algorithm because they may not like what I have to say. They're actually letting me reach all the people that are subscribing to my page. And I loved it until they got kicked off the App Store. Then they got kicked off the Google Play Store. Then they started, uh, they had some other censorship issues where the government was after or private industry because of urging from the government to the point where nobody was on it anymore. And then it got sold, right? Kanye West was going to buy it, and then he didn't buy it, and then voila, it really fell by the wayside. And I think it's just recently made a resurgence, but it's going to take work to try to get back in. Since then, something new has come out, Truth Social, right, which has been very solid, very steady, especially uh, with its um, consistent growth. So my my point is there is a, a wild, wild west when it comes to social media, and we're seeing it uh, solidify in, in, in recent times. And that's, uh, that's good. It's a good thing. However, um, does TikTok last forever? I don't know. I don't know if TikTok lasts forever. Um, but I'm hoping that Bill in Pittsburgh can weigh in. Bill, let me know your thoughts on TikTok and how it's affecting the country. Big shout out to KDKA, by the way. Well. Rich, I, I, I wasn't going to go with TikTok. I mean, I, I'm sorry. All right, hold on. Let's go to Jim in Las Cruces, New Mexico on KOBE. Jim, what are your thoughts on TikTok and how it's affecting the nation? Well, I was going to talk like Klaus Schwab, but I'll switch to my voice. <laughs> um, I, I thought they didn't fail. I, I heard the, 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 the blurb you just put out, and I thought it failed. But I guess it's, it, it got passed through the House. Yeah, no, it did get passed the House. Only 15 Republicans voted against it. Uh, it's going to the Senate, and it's likely going to pass there. I, I believe it's going to pass. I can't see who would stop it there. I mean, I guess Rand Paul might say uh, no. Uh, maybe uh, Ted Cruz. Maybe Mike Lee. Um I'm running out of names here of who I think is going to vote against it. There might be a few others, maybe Ron Johnson, but I, I don't know if it's enough to 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 not you know to to really uh, stifle it. But uh, folks at the World Economic Forum, I think, might be really mad if there's no TikTok. Right, your buddy Klaus Schwab might likely be very upset. Yes, he would be. <laughs> that but would you force want- you to come up with another poem. Oh, here we go. For those who tire of roaches and bugs, I, Klaus Schwab, have a new taste treat. Parboiled botfly grubs that pop when you bite down hard and squirt in your mouth so sweet. <laughs> I don't think I've ever tried those, and I hope I never do. Jimmy in Las Cruces, New Mexico, K-O-B-E, thank you for the call and the great Klaus Schwab impression. 
I think whenever you do those impressions, we should probably play the real Klaus Schwab so they could hear uh, how he actually sounds like a mad scientist. All right, let us continue. Uh, let's go uh, back to Bill. Bill. Bill's in Pittsburgh on KDKA. Bill, what did you want to talk about tonight? Hi, Rich. Um, uh, we all know what, what, what trouble we are in. I mean, we are in we are in deep crap, uh, and, and it's actually the Democrats that are putting us there. But I, I, I want to go back 60 years. I was nine years old. So hmm. I, I guess I gave my age up. Yeah. But uh, the night that Kennedy was assassinated, it was a Friday night. My dad and I, uh, you know, we all knew that Kennedy was assassinated. We walked down to a little deli down in, in a little uh little uh project we were living in um I, I mean i was freaked i was nine years old i was walking with my dad the uh, strongest man in the world at the time some nut came out of the woods some goofball uh came out of the woods he was uh uh, just a nut. Like he was a couple years older than me. He was uh, the the hometown uh, nut, and yell. He was yelling and screaming, "Hey, we can do anything we want to do now. We have no president." My my dad told him to get the hell back home. You know, my dad, you know, uh, just took it upon himself to do what he had to do. But right. it, it kind of freaked me out. And you bit. feel like do you feel like we're getting back to those times where everybody's kind of like in a free for all? That 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 rich that and I am afraid for Mr. Trump. I'm afraid for Donald Trump because I'm I'm not saying Kennedy. Uh, I'm not you know there are different times, but I am so afraid for Donald Trump. Yeah, well, listen, uh, I'm with you. And, and I think that there's, you know, there's a reason why, uh, you know, I, I've been to events where Bill Clinton was there and his Secret Service detail. I think it, I've always seen just like one or two people with him. Uh, Trump's always got, I think, like four or five, six people. And 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 I think partially is because he's ex-president and has Secret Service detail because he's a candidate for president. But I hope it's based on the level of threat, because I agree with you. I'm sure there's a, a lot more threats uh, against Trump than there is against Clinton. I mean, you've got the guy, the the president of the uh, IRGC, the um, I- Iranian Revolutionary Guard, that has had a pretty much an open hit on Trump, saying uh, for killing General Soleimani, that when they see him, when they catch him, when they have a chance to get him, they're going to get him, and, uh, and that's a credible threat that he made against uh, you know a, a former president of the United States. So and I think at the time he might have been a sitting president and it's just still an active threat. So you're right. Um, we, we do need to protect, um, you know, all, all of our elected officials that are may potentially end up in harm's way. But especially one like Trump that I think has been as um, bombastic as he has. He's been very vocal, very upfront about things. And and he took action against, um, you know, a, a major enemy of ours. So I, I agree with you on that front. I think that's the real deal. Folks, stick around. I'm coming right back. We've got uh, my friend Melissa is on the line, Becky in Illinois, and more, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833 482 Five three three seven eight three three four Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. Rich Valdez, who again will do a fine job, but I know you'll enjoy listening to him. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. 
That's Valdez with an S. Do the pedophiles care about lesbians? bisexuals, homosexuals, and transgender. If I am a pedophile, I don't want to go to jail. I'm a celebrity. I'm famous. Ritualistic sex is what we do with kids. It's part of our demonic culture. I want pedophilia to become normal. I want it stricken from the criminal code altogether. I'm going to push LGBTQ because if a child is old enough to decide I never want to have children, take my testicles, take my ovaries. If an 8, 9, 10, 11 year old child is old enough to make those three decisions, how can you argue that they're not old enough to decide to have sex? The argument of the pedophile is going to be backed up by this LGBT crusade against our children because in their sick minds, they are rationalizing the argument before the courts. That is Dr. Umar Johnson, someone that I typically uh, argue uh, with <laughs> and I don't typically agree with because he's a, what he calls he's a self-described pan-Africanist and has some very interesting takes on, on culture. Um, however, on this issue, I think he is positing a, a argument that makes some sense if we normalize the age of accountability, the age of majority, uh, as a younger age where a child can choose whether they are identifying as this or as that, where they can choose to stop having puberty and, and just permanently change their growth, if they can choose to actually have a, a vaginoplasty or a phalloplasty, a sex change, you know, sex reassignment surgery, if all of that can be made um, at, at the tender age of seven, eight, nine, or in some cases on TikTok, you'll see kids that are four years old with their parents uh, transitioning, quote unquote. If all of that can happen, then why wouldn't they be able to say, you know, I don't really um, like Jill. I really like Jack. And yeah, I do like Jack. And the Jack I like happens to be 50 years old. He's really great. He reminds me of my grandpa and I love him, you know, whatever. It, it, all of these things are, are possibilities when we open the door to the crazy. So my, my thinking here is that Dr. Umar Johnson is on to something with, uh, with this notion. But I'm curious to know what you all think because 30, 30% of Gen Z women identify as LGBTQ. And I, I just thought that that was such a not only high number but – just a, a crazy statistic that nearly 30% of Gen Z women in particular identify as LGBTQ. And again, this is according to the Gallup poll, not, not some fly-by-night type of thing. And big deal, right? Uh, it's actually 28.5% of women, 10.6% of, of men, excuse me, uh, born between 97 and 2012 identify as LGBTQ. In comparison to the same report found that only 12.4% of millennials um, uh, women and 5.4% uh, of millennial men identified as LGBTQ. A significant difference in the numbers, and that's why I said millennials are more conservative than the Gen Z folks, um, at least on this issue. So Umar Johnson says, change the age so you can vote younger, change the age so you can make sexual decisions younger, and this plays right into the pedophile's hands. That makes a ton of sense to me. Uh, what doesn't make sense to me is is why we, we are continually pushing this stuff, and I want to get some reaction to that and everything else we talked about tonight from Melissa. She's calling us from North Bergen, New Jersey, listening on WFAS out of New York City. Melissa, how are you, my friend? I am doing great. Thank you. I just wanted to call him because I took an Uber ride the other day and I found it pretty interesting because the guy actually was an immigrant who came here illegally, was talking about how he owned this company, waited 18 years to do everything he needed to do, and was actually pretty upset about all the illegal immigrants coming in now. And I and based on getting everything they were getting, and I said, what makes you think that they're like, what makes them think that they're getting all this free stuff? free housing, exactly like you mentioned. He said, TikTok, go on TikTok, go on any of these platforms. And there's actually people telling them, come to America. You're going to have all this free stuff. Biden's going to take care of you. You're going to have all this great lives. You're going to get a car. They were sold these dreams and they're actually, you know, being and they're getting some of it. Said it. Right. And Isn't that are. crazy? 
Right. And he was actually pretty upset because he's like, I paid taxes here for all these years. I came the legal way. And it was pretty interesting to hear from someone who actually went through the whole immigration status to hear how upset he was about the immigration situation here yeah. in America right now. Did he mention anything about the crime that, that has increased with uh, some of the gang members from Venezuela coming through? He actually did. He said he, he had another friend who also went through the whole process who also was upset and was stating that, you know, he was trying to, you know, help people out because they were saying they were hungry, whatever, and had a really hard time because there was a lot of actual crime going on. And he was hiring people who, you know, he had to wind up firing and he was, you know, short on workers because he's trying to help people and then wound up being like, hey, you know what, I'm not helping anybody anymore because I need to help myself. I'm in a bad situation and I've been doing everything right. Again, same person being another company and trying to do right, open a company, do you know, do the right thing. But he was like, it's ridiculous. And the people they're letting in are just, you know, wow. taking over and, and, and scared to go out at times, you know. And he's like, and I'm not a weak guy or anything, but he was like, you know, it's really unfair. And you know. It's totally unfair. I think you're 100% spot on. And uh, I think that's why Trump is doing so well in the polls lately, in particular with Hispanic voters. Thirty eight percent are now uh, uh, slated to be supporting Trump. And that's from a a poll uh, that came out um, not last weekend, the weekend before. Um, Melissa, thank you for your call. Great to hear your voice. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Folks are coming right back with the rest of your calls and more. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night. With Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All the time. America at Night with Rich Valdez. This is not an attempt to ban TikTok. It's an attempt to make TikTok better. Tic Tac Toe, a winner. <laughs> that is Nancy Pelosi. Uh, all I was waiting for her to say was this is us making TikTok great again. <laughs> it's MAGA for TikTok. Let's uh, wrap it up with Becky in Bloomington, Illinois. W-H-O-W. Becky, your final thoughts. Well, I think Jill Biden has been drinking the wacky juice from Joe. She, uh, they told on the radio she wants to eliminate the Easter egg roll because it's sad for the chickens. And she wants to have a potato roll. Yes, I heard about that. They're, they're thinking of rolling instead of an egg. Uh, because the egg belongs to a chicken, and I think PETA was complaining. PETA has now suggested that they use an actual potato for the Easter egg roll, and egg being potato, potato egg. Crazy. Becky, thank you for your call. Big shout-out to W-H-O-W. And, folks, that's it for me. The music means they're kicking me out of here, but I'll be back tomorrow if they let me, God willing. Hasta la próxima. Until the next time. Take care, good night, and God bless you, America. I am Rich Valdez.